Chapter 23 of Plunkett of Tammany Hall, a series of very plain talks on very practical politics. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti. Plunkett of Tammany Hall, a series of very plain talks on very practical politics by George Washington Plunkett. Chapter 23. Strenuous Life of the Tammany District Leader. Note, this chapter is based on extracts from Plunkett's diary and on my daily observation of the work of the district leader, W.L.R. The life of the Tammany district leader is strenuous. To his work is due the wonderful recuperative power of the organization. One year it goes down in defeat, and the prediction is made that it will never raise its head. The district leader, undaunted by defeat, collects his scattered forces, organizes them as only Tammany knows how to organize, and in a little while the organization is as strong as ever. No other politician in New York or elsewhere is exactly like the Tammany district leader or works as he does. As a rule, he has no business or occupation other than politics. He plays politics every day and night in the year, and his headquarters bears the inscription, Never Closed. Everybody in the district knows him, everybody knows where to find him, and nearly everybody goes to him for assistance of one sort or another, especially the poor of the tenements. He is always obliging. He will go to the police courts to put in a good word for the drunks and disorderlies, or pay their fines if a good word is not effective. He will attend christenings, weddings, and funerals. He will feed the hungry and help bury the dead. A philanthropist? Not at all. He is playing politics all the time. Brought up in Tammany Hall, he has learned how to reach the hearts of the great mass of voters. He does not bother about reaching their heads. It is his belief that arguments in campaign literature have never gained votes. He seeks direct contact with the people, does them good turns when he can, and relies on their not forgetting him on election day. His heart is always in his work, too, for his subsistence depends on its results. If he holds his district and Tammany is in power, he is amply rewarded by a good office and the opportunities that go with it. What these opportunities are has been shown by the quick rise to wealth of so many Tammany district leaders. With the examples before him of Richard Crocker, once leader of the 20th district, John F. Carroll, formerly leader of the 29th, Timothy Dry Dollar Sullivan, late leader of the 6th, and many others. He can always look forward to riches and ease while he is going through the drudgery of his daily routine. This is a record of a day's work by Plunkett. 2 a.m. Aroused from sleep by the ringing of his doorbell, went to the door and found a bartender, who asked him to go to the police station and bail out a saloon keeper who had been arrested for violating the excise law, furnished bail, and returned to bed at 3 o'clock. 6 a.m. Awakened by fire engines passing his house. Hastened to the scene of the fire, according to the custom of the Tammany district leaders, to give assistance to the fire sufferers, if needed. Met several of his election district captains, who are always under orders to look out for fires, which are considered great vote-getters. Found several tenants, who had been burned out. Took them to a hotel, supplied them with clothes, fed them, and arranged temporary quarters for them until they could rent and furnish new apartments. 8.30 a.m. Went to the police court to look after his constituents, found six drunks, secured the discharge of four by a timely word with the judge, and paid the fines of two. 9 a.m. Appeared in the municipal district court, directed one of his district captains to act as counsel for a widow against whom dispossessed proceedings had been initiated and obtained an extension of time, paid the rent of a poor family, about to be dispossessed, and gave them a dollar for food. 11 a.m., at home again, found four men waiting for him. One had been discharged by the Metropolitan Railway Company for neglect of duty, and wanted the district leader to fix things. Another wanted a job on the road. The third sought a place on the subway, and the fourth, a plumber, was looking for work with the Consolidated Gas Company. The district leader spent nearly three hours fixing things for the four men and succeeded in each case. 3 p.m. Attended the funeral of an Italian as far as the ferry. Hurried back to make his appearance at the funeral of a Hebrew constituent. Went conspicuously to the front both in the Catholic Church and the synagogue. 
and later attended the Hebrew confirmation ceremonies in the synagogue. 7 p.m. Went to district headquarters and presided over a meeting of election district captains. Each captain submitted a list of all the voters in his district, reported on their attitude toward Tammany, suggested who might be won over and how they could be won, told who were in need and who were in trouble of any kind and the best way to reach them. District leader took notes and gave orders. 8 p.m. Went to a church fair. Took chances on everything. Bought ice cream for the young girls and the children. Kissed the little ones. Flattered the mother. And took their fathers out for something down at the corner. 9 p.m. At the clubhouse again. Spent $10 on tickets for a church excursion. And promised a subscription for a new church bell. Bought tickets for a baseball game to be played by two nines from his district. Listened to the complaints of a dozen pushcart peddlers who said they were persecuted by the police and assured them he would go to police headquarters in the morning and see about it. 10.30 p.m. Attended a Hebrew wedding reception and dance. Had previously sent a handsome wedding present to the bride. 12 p.m. In bed. This is the actual record of one day in the life of Plunkett. He does some of the same things every day, but his life is not so monotonous as to be wearisome. Sometimes the work of a district leader is exciting, especially if he happens to have a rival who intends to make a contest for the leadership at the primaries. In that case, he is even more alert, tries to reach the fires before his rival, sends out runners to look for drunks and disorderlies at the police station, and keeps a very close watch on the obituary columns of the newspapers. A few years ago, there was a bitter contest for the Tammany leadership of the Ninth District between John C. Sheehan and Fred J. Goodwin. Both had long experience in Tammany politics and both understood every move of the game. Every morning their agents went to their respective headquarters before seven o'clock and read through the death notices in all the morning papers. If they found that anybody in the district had died, they rushed to the homes of their principals with the information and then there was a race to the house of the deceased to offer condolences, and, if the family were poor, something more substantial. On the day of the funeral there was another contest. Each faction tried to surpass the other in number and appearances of the carriages it sent to the funeral, and more than once they almost came to blows at the church or in the cemetery. On one occasion the Goodwinites played a trick on their adversaries, which has since been imitated in other districts. A well-known liquor dealer, who had a considerable following, died, and both Sheehan and Goodwin were eager to become his political heir by making a big showing at the funeral. Goodwin managed to catch the enemy napping. He went to all the livery stables in the district, hired all the carriages for the day, and gave orders to two hundred of his men to be on hand as mourners. Sheehan had never had any trouble about getting all the carriages that he wanted, so he let the matter go until the night before the funeral. Then he found that he could not hire a carriage in the district. He called his district committee together in a hurry and explained the situation to them. He could get all the vehicles he needed in the adjoining district, he said, but if he did that, Goodwin would rouse the voters of the Ninth by declaring that he, Sheehan, had patronized foreign industries. Finally, it was decided that there was nothing to do but to go over to 6th Avenue and Broadway for carriages. Sheehan made a fine turnout at the funeral, but the deceased was hardly in his grave before Goodwin raised the cry of protection to home industries and denounced his rival for patronizing livery stable keepers outside of his district. The error had its effect in the primary campaign. As all events, Goodwin was elected leader. A recent contest for the leadership of the second district illustrated further the strenuous work of the Tammany district leaders. The contestants were Patrick Diver, who had managed the district for years, and Thomas F. Foley. Both were particularly anxious to secure the large Italian vote. They not only attended all the Italian christenings and funerals, but also kept a close lookout for the marriages in order to be on hand with wedding presents. At first, each had his own reporter in the Italian quarter to keep track of the marriages. Later, Foley conceived a better plan. He hired a man to stay all day at the City Hall Marriage Bureau, where most Italian couples go through the civil ceremony, and telephoned to him at his saloon when anything was doing at the bureau. 
Foley had a number of presents ready for use, and whenever he received a telephone message from his man, he hastened to the city hall with a ring or watch or a piece of silver and handed it to the bride with his congratulations. As a consequence, when Diver got the news and went to the home of the couple with his present, he always found that Foley had been ahead of him. Toward the end of the campaign, Diver also stationed a man at the marriage bureau, and then there were daily foot races and fights between the two healers. Sometimes the rivals came into conflict at the deathbed. One night a poor Italian peddler died in Roosevelt Street. The news reached Diver and Foley about the same time, and as they knew the family of the man was destitute. Each went to an undertaker and brought him to the Roosevelt Street tenement. The rivals and the undertakers met at the house, and an altercation ensued. After much discussion, the diver undertaker was selected. Foley had more carriages at the funeral, however, and he further impressed the Italian voters by paying the widow's rent for a month and sending her half a ton of coal and a barrel of flour. The rivals were put on their mettle toward the end of the campaign by the wedding of a daughter of one of the original Cohens of the Baxter Street region. The Hebrew vote in the district is nearly as large as the Italian vote, and Diver and Foley set out to capture the Cohens and their friends. They stayed up nights thinking about what they would give the bride. Neither knew how much the other was prepared to spend on a wedding present, or what form it would take, so spies were employed by both sides to keep watch on the jewelry stores, and the jewelers of the district were bribed by each side to impart the desired information. At last Foley heard that Diver had purchased a set of silver knives, forks, and spoons. He at once bought a duplicate set, and added a silver tea service. When the presents were displayed at the home of the bride, Diver was not in a pleasant mood, and he charged his jeweler with treachery. It may be added that Foley won at the primaries. One of the fixed duties of a Tammany district leader is, is to give two outings every summer, one for the men of his district and the other for the women and children, and a beefsteak dinner and a ball every winter. The scene of the outings is usually one of the groves around the Sound. The ambition of the district leader on these occasions is to demonstrate that his men have broken all records in the matter of eating and drinking. He gives out the exact number of pounds of beef, poultry, butter, etc., that they have consumed and professes to know how many potatoes and ears of corn have been served. According to his figures, the average eating record of each man at the outing is about ten pounds of beef, two or three chickens, a pound of butter, a half peck of potatoes, and two dozen ears of corn. The drinking records, as given out, are still more phenomenal. For some reason not yet explained, the district leader thinks that his popularity will be greatly increased if he can show that his followers can eat and drink more than the followers of any other district leader. The same idea governs the beefsteak dinners in the winter. It matters not what sort of steak is served or how it is cooked. The district leader considers only the question of quantity, and when he excels all others in this particular, he feels somehow that he is a bigger man and deserves more patronage than his associates in the Tammany Executive Committee. As to the balls, they are the events of the winter in the extreme east side and west side society. Mamie and Maggie and Jenny prepare for them months in advance, and their young men save up for the occasion, just as they save for the summer trips to Coney Island. The district leader is in his glory at the opening of the ball. He leads the coalition with the prettiest women present, his wife, if he has one, permitting, and spends almost the whole night shaking hands with his constituents. The ball costs him a pretty penny, but he has found that the investment pays. By these means, the Tammany district leader reaches out into the homes of his district, keeps watch not only on the men, but also on the women and children knows their needs, their likes and dislikes, their troubles and their hopes, and places himself in a position to use his knowledge for the benefit of his organization and himself. Is it any wonder that scandals do not permanently disable Tammany and that it speedily recovers from what seems to be a crushing defeat? End of chapter 23. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. End of Plunkett of Tammany Hall. A series of very plain talks on Very Practical Politics by George Washington Plunkett.